Okay. Okay. Uh, shall we start, Serafina? I think it's ten minutes. We don't time. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Sir. So, hello everyone. Thank you for uh, joining the our webinar series. Uh, this is part of a webinar series that we have been uh, trying to organize once in a month, or depending on the availability of uh, our guests, uh, to introduce the possibility of pursuing a social history of mathematical practices, especially in the context of socially fragmented societies. And uh, Serafina has been consistently interested and in working, and we have been learning a lot from her work on ancient Greek and Roman numeracy. Uh, she has, uh, and I'm particularly very thankful to Serafina. And uh, you know, in order to be able to address the issue of social fragmentation and uh, dissonance in mathematical thinking. So this is very much uh, a concern to our project, which is to uh, look at what is the meaning of universality in socially fragmented societies through the prism of mathematical thinking in history as well as in contemporary uh, economies. So I would rather ask uh, Serafina to uh, tell us about her uh, recent uh, work, which is about uh, the approach of distributed cognition and which I'm sure all of us are waiting to hear from her. And uh, once Serafina finishes, then we'll have a uh, discussion uh, session and please do uh, ask your questions via the chat module or just raise your hand and then we can ask the questions. I hope that's okay. Thank you, Serafina, once again, and please do. Uh... Yes, I want to start by thanking you for inviting me. It's a great opportunity to um, have, you know, a, 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 an audience that's interested in the social history of mathematical practices and I would really like to know maybe in the questions how you define what the fragmented society is. I think it's a very interesting uh, term and it certainly matches some of the situations I'm, I'm looking at in my research. So the talk today is part of my ongoing research on ancient Greek and Roman numeracy um, one of the things that I find interesting about looking at numeracy in the ancient Greek and Roman society is that uh, there is certainly fragmentation in the evidence that we have because um, numeracy, by which I mean counting, calculating and measuring, was uh, uh, certainly widespread in the society, but at the same time, there aren't a lot of texts that uh, talk about it. So uh, we have to try and reconstruct it from fragments or uh, uh, occasional mentions in texts and also from uh, material culture in the form of uh, inscriptions, as we'll see, sometimes objects. So that's the first way in which there is fragmentation in, in what I'm doing. And the second sense is that while uh, both, um, say, the um, some Greek societies, for instance, Athens in the classical period, which we take to be the 5th and the 4th century BCE, or uh, uh, Rome in the uh, glory days of the Roman Empire, which are the 1st and 2nd century CE, present themselves as empires, at the same time, they were in fact quite fragmented in their attempts to impose control and order from the center to the vast peripheries of the provinces of the empire. So there's a kind of paradoxical fragmentation in those societies because there's a strong attempts at imposing control and not being fragmentary, but that doesn't quite work. So it's as if the fragmentation in, for instance, imposing standards happens despite attempts to impose them, which is the second way in which I see fragmentation happening here. <coughs> but let's start maybe by describing 
uh, the distributed cognition framework I intend to use. And then I will argue in the rest of the paper for the advantages of using a distributed cognition framework in reconstructing ancient Greek and Roman numeracy. And could I have the next slide, please? Thank you. So um, apologies for uh, um, repeating things that you could, you might already know. Um, distributed cognition uh, is part of uh, cognitive anthropology and uh, it's been around for a long time, but my specific discipline, which is classics at the moment, is uh, discovering cognitive anthropology um, maybe you know since the last 10 years. So there is at the moment what we call a cognitive term in uh, the UK and the US of A in classics. And one of the texts that is being kind of rediscovered is this book, uh, Cognition in the Wild, which was published in 1995 by an anthropologist called Edwin Hutchins. It's a, a, an old book by now, uh, and it has been you know, criticized, revised, even by its own author. But uh, when I talk about distributed cognition, I find that the formulation that uh, Hutchins gave in this this book is still very useful. So I will mostly be referring to uh, the 1995 book, uh, to that framework of you know, what distributed cognition is. Um, first and foremost, um, Cognition in the Wild is a book about navigation. So uh, it contains uh, two main case studies. One is a, a historical one, and it it's a, a case study about how um, navigators from Micronesia reach islands in their canoes. So we have a case study where um, the story is about one person, the part navigator, in a, a relatively small boat, a canoe, reaching an island uh, without any of the instruments that we would use today uh, you know, in a big ship. The main case study, however, is that of a really big ship, um, a ship belonging to the uh, US Navy. And uh, Hutchins himself is embedded with the crew and uh, uh, is participating in the operations whereby this uh, huge U.S. Navy ship is trying to navigate in. So we have a small ship and a big ship, and uh, Hutchins, in, uh, you know, through anthropological style, is part of the crew in the second case. So he can observe what other people are doing is not really meant to participate he does participate in one case and he can just you know um, record all the sequence of operations that the crew on board the US, the US Navy ship carries out in order to uh, maneuver this big ship into port it's uh, you know I won't go into the details uh, it's uh, quite a riveting story at some point they make mistakes and Hutchins feels uh, obliged to intervene but uh, um, the, the gist of the book is that um, both the case studies show that uh, these complex tasks navigating a small ship or a, a, a small boat a small boat or a big ship can be understood as distributed. So Hutchins comes to a general description of a cognitive task um, in What that means is that these tasks are carried out collectively by humans and objects that possess different competencies and perform different functions. In the first case study, uh, we have the navigator, the canoe, and the navigation technique uh, handed down through generations in Micronesia called ETAC. In the second case, the one that Hutchins is observing directly, we have a, a complex task uh, 
maneuvering the ship into port, which is distributed across a crew of people, of men specifically, which is hierarchically organized. We have, you know, people who are in command and the people who have to take their orders. Um, across also objects, specifically navigation instruments and charts. So that's the bullet point on the slide. The first main feature of a distributed cognition framework is that cognition is distributed across humans and non-humans. It's a collective task and it's spread across humans and objects. Their respective navigation tasks could not take place without a division of labor, which can be physical or cognitive in nature. Hutchins believes, and I agree with him, that this can be generalized to many other cognitive tasks, so that a lot of other tasks, not just navigation, can be seen as distributed across human agents and objects. Another important feature of distributed cognition is that uh, um, cognitive tasks take place across internal representations, i.e. Uh, representations in the mind, for instance, uh, um, ideas and notions about uh, uh, where the destination is, ideas about what can be done to reach that destination, but also external representations, for instance, navigational charts or maps. This is an important point because uh, um, Hutchins and other cognitive anthropologists make it clear that cognitive tasks don't just happen within someone's mind. They happen across internal minds representations, but also external representations. Um, the way he puts it is, uh, and I quote, cognition crosses in and out of the skin and skull, and I unquote. Again, apologies if this sounds uh, like something that in, in a sense wasn't in doubt all along, but particularly when applied to mathematics, I find the insight that uh, there isn't just the mind, but also what happens out of the skin particularly useful. The third point and feature of distributed cognition that I wanted to bring to your attention is that the group's cognitive properties are not the same as those of the members of the group. So the group performing the cognitive task may have cognitive properties that differ from the cognitive properties of any one individual. It's a way of saying that uh, the sum is more, the whole is more than the sum of its parts. Cognitive tasks are collective, not just in an additional sense, but in a more holistic sense. And the fourth and final feature is that cognitive tasks possess both a computational organization, which we can uh, um, conceive of as a sequence of steps, the fulfilling of which means that the task is accomplished, but also a social organization, which structures interactions among the participants. So distributed cognition pays attention both to procedures that mean that a certain task is, has been accomplished, but also the hierarchies or other ways of social organizations that bring to the computational organization being accomplished. So we keep those four features in mind at all times, but I hope they will become clearer once I start applying them to uh, my examples, which are mathematical. Distributed cognition, then, is part of uh, trends in cognitive anthropology that have pointed out that knowledge is embodied, is not uh, disembodied. Again, this, on the one hand, may sound like a statement of the obvious, on the other hand, it possibly still needs a state, in particularly when talking about mathematics.
I find it fascinating that uh, Hutchins talks about ships and pilots because one of the classical um, views of knowledge that is reacting against is that of René Descartes, the, uh, God, is it 17th century or 18th century, the early modern French philosopher who was one of the, apart from uh, basically the, uh, one of the discoverers of uh, uh, analytic geometry, at least in Europe, was also a proponent of a strong distinction, in fact, a separation between the mind and the body. One of the images that Descartes used was that the mind is in the body like a pilot in the ship. But what he meant was that uh, the ship is just this external thing and it's the pilot that moves it, directs it, controls it. So Hutchins is using a, a similar case, but kind of saying completely different things about the relationship, if you like, between the pilot and the ship. So I leave it there. Um, I should add that the distributed cognition is not the only cognitive anthropology tool that I use in my work on numeracy. I also make extensive use of the concept of community of practice, which again has been um, developed and discussed by a number of people, but I take its formulation by Jean Lave and uh, um, Herbert, I think, Venga, um, where a community of practice is a group whose collective identity is uh, um, determined by the fact that they're engaged in a cognitive task. The difference between the concept of community of practice, as we find it in Leib and Wenger, and uh, Hutchins's notion of a group across which a cognitive task is distributed, is that the, that the community of practice focuses on human agents, rather than objects. So the participation of non-human agents is very important in Hutchins's model. And also that the community of practice is also quite a lot about how knowledge has been acquired by the participants. So community of practice is a useful concept to talk about the training and education. Whereas distributed cognition focuses on uh, that knowledge already in action. Um, I also use the notion of situation specificity or situatedness, which has been developed by, again, Leib and Wenger, but also by Donna Haraway um, in, a, in a famous uh, short article. So, um, while the concepts of community of practice and situated knowledge inform my approach to mathematics and numeracy in particular, what I think distributed cognition adds to the mix is a more fine-grained account of specific episodes of counting, calculating and measuring, and also, as I shall argue, of numerate knowledge production and practice. So all that was uh, uh, the kind of theoretical foreword, the preface. Let's see how we can apply uh, the theoretical framework to the historical case study. And could we move to the third slide, please? Thank you. So the first uh, sense in which I think it can be useful to apply a distributed cognition framework to ancient Greek and Roman numeracy is uh, in a redefinition or reconsideration of uh, um, authorship of mathematical texts. So, at first blush, when we think of ancient Greek and Roman mathematics, at least from a West-centered perspective, we don't particularly think in terms of collective efforts. So the current image of Greek mathematics in particular is associated very strongly with the notion of the lone genius. For instance, when we look at ways in which Archimedes, often described as the greatest mathematician, Greek mathematician at least, 
we don't think of him as part of a group. He comes across as having operated on his own. Uh, again, if we think of Euclid, the author of the elements, um, his authorial role is as elusive as he seems, uh, you know, uh, characteristics of what he's doing. Um, one of the most widely cited papers about uh, Greek mathematicians is an article by Reviel Nets who uh, came to the conclusion that if we had to paint a, a group picture of Greek mathematicians, we'd have a very sparse group picture. There weren't a lot of mathematicians, according to him, and, and uh, uh, particularly, according to Nets in this article, collaboration between mathematicians, while he was actively sought, including by Archimedes, was in actuality often impossible, given how few mathematicians there were at any given point in time. So overall, the traditional picture of Greek mathematics, ancient Greek mathematics, is that of a, a, a lone enterprise, punctuated by bursts of solitary genius. One of the things I've been trying to do with my work on numeracy is to widen the definition of who counts as a mathematician. Nets gave quite stringent um, requirements. He said that we can only count someone as a mathematician if there's evidence that they proved a new theorem or statements. My definition, however, because I'm looking at numeracy, uh, is extended to anyone who was engaged in numerate practices. Obviously, once you change the definition, you also reveal a much more heavily and diversely populated landscape. But also, and perhaps more crucially, if we apply a distributed cognition framework, to Greek mathematics, I think that will enable us to see some uh, well-known evidence in a different light. So what you see here is the page of a manuscript of Euclid's elements. It's, I think, from book one, I mean, I recognize from the diagram that uh, uh, the Greek text is about the theorem of Pythagoras, so-called. So this would be... Uh, Book one, proposition 46 or 47 of Euclid's Elements. I chose this picture, which is obviously a much later manuscript than the time Euclid was writing um, in, because even just looking at the manuscript, it becomes clear that there's more than one hand involved. This manuscript has uh, uh, what we could call a main text in the middle, and then a more text around the margins, um, text that has been added as a kind of possibly a gloss or explanation on the diagram, text in the small uh, space between two columns of, of text. The image already makes the point that uh, um, if we apply a distributed cognition framework, some texts, even though they might bear the name of one author, Euclid in this case, are in fact better described as a cumulative or as accretion of different layers of authorship, or in fact as collective efforts and thus distributed. So how many people wrote this book? The answer is probably not just one. Euclid's elements is maybe an extreme example, but we have other examples from uh, Greek and Roman antiquity. For instance, a body of texts known as the Corpus Agrimensorum Romanorum, which was written in an imperial context and was about the land surveying. It was uh, written for the uh, professional use of uh, uh, Roman land surveyors, so they could go out to mostly territories that had been conquered by the Romans in order to measure them, divide them up, and then distribute them to um, military veterans, soldiers who had been discharged, and as part of their uh, leave package were often given 
a piece of land elsewhere, you know, not in Rome, but in the in the colonies, we could say, um, for their own use. So the uh, this particular body of text is accumulation, a collective effort. We have a lot of different texts. Some of them are anonymous. Some of them reveal several layers, but they come together as one body of text. We have other examples such as uh, the pseudo Aeronian Geometrica, attributed but not by Hero of Alexandria, which also appears to be the result of several hands over the course of time. We have even papyri that appear to be the collection of different geometrical problems constituted over time. Um, this can be seen as uh, examples of cognition distributed across the different people, locations, and times. Um, going back to the land surveying texts, for instance, um, we have a definite cognitive tasks, such as distributing land or identifying boundaries, and they accrue contributions by several authors, both named and unnamed, in our versions of the text. What gels them together is a strong sense of professional identity, of service to the empire, and what we could call a community of practice. Euclid's Elements is, as I've said, the less obvious example, but uh, in itself is the result of uh, accretions, subtractions, reworkings spread across uh, several diachronic agents. Euclid is simply one of those agents maybe the most important, but just one of the many people involved in this collective enterprise, which again, we could fit under the umbrella of distributed cognition. We can also think of texts that engage directly and explicitly with previous texts. And in Greek and Roman mathematics, uh, for instance, we have a lot of commentaries. A commentary, is another example of a, a, a cognitive task that fits the description of distributed cognition. They have a clear temporal dimension, and then and now, a distribution across time, because the commentary is not the result of one person, but is the result of everybody who's contributed to the transmission and then clarification, explanation, building on of these particular texts. Um, there is the rhetoric in these texts of uh, standing on the shoulders of giants, even though that expression is, is later. That is, once again, very much compatible, I would say, with a distributed cognition framework. So, to recap this uh, uh, part, and before we move on to the next slide, Arguably, a distributed cognition framework can help us make better sense of the cumulative, accretive, collective nature of many, if not most, if not all, of uh, uh, the texts that constitute Greek and Roman mathematics. Can we move on to the next slide? Please. Thank you. So, apart from well-known texts, such as uh, Euclid's Elements, I found that distributed cognition can be very useful in uh, um, recovering the significance of mathematical texts that are not... <coughs> oh, sorry. <coughs> Let me get some a glass of water. Sorry. Please, please, yes. Yeah. Okay, so the second type of text that I think distributed cognition can be useful in, uh, in looking at are uh, uh, mostly authorless. That doesn't mean that nobody wrote them, obviously, but they're not as uh, um, linked to an individual name as Euclid's elements is. These texts have been traditionally rather neglected because uh, the mathematics uh, that they are evidence of is not very advanced. 
So I'm talking about uh, arithmetical tables, such as the one you see here, um, mostly surviving on papyrus rather than manuscripts, but also about astronomical tables, um, tables that uh, had uh, specifications for the building of catapults. So texts that are mathematical were very widely used, but uh, concern more the, the domain of numeracy, I guess, than of what we would call advanced mathematics. Um, Arithmetical tables uh, were mostly of multiplication and uh, division. So what you see here is a fragment of a table of parts. There are around, I think, 50 that survive, uh, all from um, mostly Roman Egypt, um, because you know the nature of uh, um, papyrus uh, makes it easier to survive in the climatic conditions of Egypt, but it's, uh, it's uh, um, a good guess that more such tables existed from the rest of the Mediterranean area. Um, I see, I consider these tables to be cognitive tools um, in the same way that uh, Hutchins describes cognitive tools uh, in his 1995 book. So let me cite from what he says about uh, um, a type of cognitive tool, which is navigational charts. So um, when he's on this ship embedded in the crew, Hutchins notices that uh, um, the crew makes a, a very extensive use of navigational charts. You have to remember it's 1995, so we're not talking about GPS yet. So, you know, that would already not be valid anymore. Uh, it says about navigational charts, those who make the chart and those who use it are not known to one another. Perhaps they are not even contemporaries. Yet they are joint participants in a computational event every time the chart is used. I think that happens exactly really in the same way for ar arithmetical tables. Um, it's not clear when the knowledge that originally went into these tables originated. And in fact, there is a, a very strong indication that there's a continuity between arithmetical tables produced in early Egyptian times. We're talking pharaonic times through Ptolemaic times, through Roman times, uh, because of the way, for instance, that uh, uh, unit fractions in our uh, uh, definition of unit fractions are used. So it's uh, very much the case for a table like this, that the person who originally uh, put the knowledge, the, the, you know, the data in the table together, and the person using the table are not known from uh, to one another. They may be separated by centuries, but every time that the table is used, they are joint participants in a computational event. That's the same with the astronomical tables. Um, astronomical tables indicate the positions of the known planets, mostly, for basically every day, pretty much, of the year. They're now known as Most, you know, a, a very important batch of astronomical tables found in Egypt during Roman times, written in Greek, um, draw on data that were originally uh, put together in Mesopotamia centuries before. Even Ptolemy, the most famous uh, uh, Greco-Roman astronomer, the author of the Almagest, used the data for his tables that were uh, um, they were using you know were harvested from previous authors including as he says uh, uh, chaldeans i again mesopotamian astronomers so these are authorless collective texts and it's precisely this feature that makes them uh, suitable for uh, a distributed cognition um, framework the cognitive task 
happens across the centuries and across the different civilizations and languages precisely because it is distributed. Distributed across time, distributed across space, distributed across uh, human agents, the uh, compilers of the data and the users of the table, but also across non-human agents, the tables themselves, and particularly their uh, uh, characteristics such as uh, formatting. You can see, for instance, that this looks like a table. The data are in columns rather than just you know, being one piece of writing. Um, Again, and can we move to the next slide, sorry. I have looked at accounts. So tables are quite exciting, aren't they? But I'm also one of the few uh, people, I think, who finds accounts uh, extraordinarily interesting. So one of the most uh, common type of document to have survived from uh, um, Ptolemaic Hellenistic and the Roman Egypt is accounts. Accounts for uh, public bodies, but also accounts for households, sometimes the larger states, sometimes the smaller ones. Um, what you have here is uh, in the big picture um, a detail of uh, um, a document called the Kelly's Agricultural Account Book. It's actually not on papyrus, but it is on wooden tablets. It's a fourth century CE, and it was found in an oasis uh, at da Dakra. I, I'm forgetting all the names, but I got the notes somewhere if someone wants the details. And it uh, um, accounts for one part of a very large estate, mostly um, exploited in agricultural terms. The account must have been written by not the landlord. The landlord was uh, uh, living in the bigger town, but by one of the supervisors of one part of the estate. I've just posted it in the smaller picture with, uh, uh, this is a papyrus, so with in fact a tax register, so an account of a different sort. This is called the Karanis tax roll because it was found at Karanis and it's one of the instruments uh, through which uh, the Roman Empire controlled uh, the provinces, particularly uh, um, a rich and productive province such as Egypt. So it's a tax register with names and uh, amounts that uh, everyone in the town of Karanis has to pay. It's an extremely uh, important and interesting document. But the reason why you have this here is because like uh, tables, accounts are uh, the products of multiple hands. Um, Larger accounts, such as the uh, Kelly's Agricultural Account Book, but we have many, many other examples, sometimes uh, subsume smaller accounts. So uh, the area controlled by the supervisor that wrote this account comprised of smaller bits of land. People in these smaller bits of land were supposed to produce their own little accounts, and then they were all incorporated into the larger accounts. And this account, presumably, then went into even larger accounts in the center of the estate, which would have been the residence of the landlord in uh, uh, the bigger town. Not only that, often we can see the presence of different hands on an account. Sometimes they add things, sometimes they correct things. Sometimes uh, when uh, sums are paid, for instance, they're uh, uh, scrubbed, they're cancelled, scrubbed out, and then maybe another sum is written. There's a particularly interesting example from the 4th century CE from another town called the Ospolis Parva, where... Uh, um, Notations on the main accounts written by the landowner have been added by people who then um, initialize their contributions. And so we know that one of these accounts was uh, uh, written by the uh, landowner, 
but uh, contributed to by someone called Elias, who, and this is very, very important evidence, adds to his name the fact that he is a helper. And the word he uses suggests that he may have been a slave, an enslaved person working on, on the estate. So this could be one of the very few bits of evidence uh, for lower uh, status, if not even actually enslaved people, being numerate, checking the accounts, maybe doing the calculations, correcting even the accounts of their landlord. Um, I also want to show you a very interesting uh, small account. And can we have the next slide? You can see that I could go on about accounts for, for this. This is from the so-called archive of Heroninus. It's once again from a very large estate in Roman Egypt. I like it because it's one of those smaller accounts that then went into the larger accounts. And it's written by someone, again, whose status is quite low. Um, if you read the traditional history of uh, Greek or Roman mathematics, you know, Roman and Egyptian mathematics from this period, these people are not supposed to exist. The numerate, literate, lower status people. They're not part of traditional history, and yet here they are. So the account says, to the most honorable Aurelia Demetria, through her administrators, Elius Epimachus, from Suhamon of Deidas, salaried worker of the so-called lot of nine Aruras. And uh, it's fragmentary, so, you know, like all um, papyri, there are holes in it. That's where you find the, the dots. So um, there's the measuring involved uh, by uh, possibly a land surveyor. And uh, uh, the abbreviation DR stands for drachmae, which is the unit of currency common at the time. Work was required, um, so um, Suhamon indicates how many bricks have been used, um, how much the nails for the work cost. So it's a little bit of account. Um, the last line is a date. Tooth is one of the Egyptian mums. I think it's lovely. I mean, it's, uh, it is amazing. It's addressed to a woman. That's the wife of the landlord, but she owned the property in her own right. So she figures as the, the addressee of several uh, uh, you know, um, lower level accounts. Uh, the name of uh, um, the names of the people here. Sorry, my phone is ringing. Let me just go and put it off. Sorry about that. That's the downside of working from home. So the names here are a very interesting mix of uh, um, Egyptian. Suhamun is an Egyptian name of Greek, like Epimachus Demetria, with a Roman layer on top, because Aurelia uh, indicates that she was a Roman citizen and is a Roman name. So. Um, Apart from everything else, what I find amazing about this, uh, this account is that it's once again uh, evidence for distributed cognition. Because uh, this small account, which again is uh, evidence of a cognitive task in many ways, accounting for how much was spent on the work that was done in this particular piece of land, the lot of nine Aruras, Aruras is a, a unit of measurement for, for land, goes probably into a larger account, and that goes into a larger account, and uh, the agency here is collective, because uh, even Suhamon, who's a salaried worker, so his status in society wouldn't have been very high, participates in the complex cognitive task of keeping an account for this incredibly large estate. So in conclusion, a distributed cognition framework allows us to analyze mathematical texts that are authorless and non-canonical in terms of the communities of practice involved.
both synchronically at the same time, there's even a geographical aspect here, and diachronically across time. It also illuminates rather than hide the relationships between the agents involved. And those range from inventing traditions in the commentaries, for instance, to mapping enlarged households such as this, and from a shared sense of purpose to more constrained and coercive duties and responsibilities. Can we move on to the next slide, please? I want to just go very quickly through the ways in which distributed cooperation can also illuminate the practices and not just texts. We've looked at texts, but texts are only you know, the tip of the iceberg of numeracy in a certain society across a certain period. Most of the counting, calculating and measuring was done um, outside of texts, performatively. So what I, um, one of the ways in which I find distributed cognition very uh, useful is that I think it can help us to reimagine the conditions in which the practices took place. For instance, by giving more consideration to the role played by material culture. So, for instance, calculation and counting, um, I think, can be seen as distributed. This is um, from a funerary monument in uh, um, what is today Germany, actually, kind of on the border to France, Belgium and this uh, collective counting scene. The person buried, um, well, his family, but the, the main, like, you know, father of the house buried uh, where this was found, was probably a trader of, or merchant, and uh, all those little objects there are coins. So it's a kind of a, a office accounting scene. So calculation um, was distributed across calculating devices, uh, fingers, uh, counters, uh, counting boards, and people. I like the fact that uh, often, explicitly, counting scenes have got a lot of people. There's uh, the calculator themselves, so there's onlookers, there's assistants. Uh, some of the um, arithmetical operations on the counting board were probably carried out with the aid of uh, another person, someone other than the calculating, for instance, holding numbers on their fingers. Um, even the small uh, Roman type abacus, which fits in the palm of one's hand, can be imagined as a, 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 a prosthetic device, an extension of one's fingers. So that's, again, a, a perfect example of what Hutchins calls cognitive tools. Can we move on to the next slide, please? The same goes for measuring. I'm very struck by how the representations of measuring in the Greek, the few we have, but particularly the Roman world, this is a mosaic on the floor of a building in Ostia, um, Ostia was the port of Rome, and it was one of the main destinations for uh, uh, ships carrying grain coming from Egypt and North Africa to bring the grain, sometimes as a tribute, mm -hmm. to the population of Rome, where it was distributed sometimes um, for free. So, next Sorry, there is someone who has left. Mr. Oh, Salih, okay. could you please mute yourself? Salih? Hey, hey. Yeah, thank you. I realize I'm, uh, I'm uh, I mean, we started a bit late, but I'll try to, to stay within uh, uh, the time. Sure. Please, yeah. So measuring was also a, a collective enterprise, and as such, it fits, a dis, it, it fits a distributed cognition framework very well, um, as I think exemplified by this image. It was certainly distributed across people and objects, and uh, uh, the material 
in the in the after the talk can we have the next slide so this again i don't want to spend a lot of time talking about it but i can answer questions about it it's a, a, an inscription Sample of uh, attempt to enforce measuring practices within an imperial context. So uh, it was issued in the 5th century BCE at the time when the city of Athens was uh, the uh, hegemonic city, the capital, we should say, of a small empire across that part of the Mediterranean. And what it does is uh, it informs in quite uh, uh, strong terms their own coinage, their own uh, weight um, and uh, volume measures on the other cities in the empire. So um, even this inscription itself is to me uh, something that fits a distributed cognition framework quite well, because what you see is only one part of one copy. So the Athenian democracy, which was a democracy at home, but an empire uh, if you were not Athenian, decided that it was a good idea to try and impose metrological standards on uh, their subjects. They had this text inscribed in at least nine different copies, and that those slabs of stone, some of them quite big, must have been physically carried to several locations across the empire because uh, bits of them survive in at least nine different places. It's interesting that the text is not even the same on all uh, exemplars as far as being possible to, to reconstruct it. Uh, but that was uh, only one of the distribution acts involved. The idea was that once they received this, uh, this inscription, this uh, new law, this order, the local communities would then create new metrological objects and also new coins they, to follow the Athenian standards. So the whole abstract idea of standardization became uh, potentially concrete in this act of distribution across people and objects across a whole area of the Mediterranean. We don't know if the law was actually enforced, which is another interesting aspect, but it seems as if this was about disseminating and distributing as much as enforcing the standardization itself. In conclusion, then, I would say that applying a distributed cognition framework allows us to analyze numerate practices not only beyond the texts, but also around and about texts. And I move to the last part of my talk. And can I have the next slide? So one, uh, I think, a very important way in which this particular methodological tool borrowed from cognitive anthropology can be useful for a study of Greek and Roman numeracy is in understanding the role of subordinate agents in uh, uh, numerate practices and in particular enslaved agents. So um, Greek and Roman society legalized chattel slavery so it was legal to own uh, human beings as uh, helpers, uh, aids, uh, sexual uh, uh, slaves, really, and uh, um, sell them, you know, sell ch children. Uh, there were uh, regulations within Greek and Roman societies that occasionally made, uh, um, made it possible for enslaved people to acquire their freedom. That, but that was relatively unusual, particularly in, um, in the Greek world. So more and more, the field of classics um, is the trying to retrieve 
the um, epistemological role of enslaved people, uh, both within literature and within, and this would be part of my study, within numerate practices. So it seems that a lot of the people who counted, calculated, measured the things in the Greek and Roman words, particularly in the context of empires, were enslaved. The fact that they were enslaved makes them virtually invisible because their status was so low that they don't really come to the surface in terms of uh, authorship or agency. Um, what you see here, for instance, is uh, um, again a funerary relief, it's called the Testamentum Relief, it's from Rome, the capital, where you have uh, three members of uh, a rich household, a matron, a woman, a man who's probably the deceased, and uh, a portrait of an ancestor. And then on the side, you have an enslaved man. Uh, it could be that he's smaller because he's a boy, so uh, indicator indication of age, but it could be in smaller size also because of his status. And what is fascinating there is that he's uh, counting on a counting board. So what he's doing there is moving count counters around to perform some kind of calculation, which might have to do with the inheritance that the, um, the dead man has left. So that is a crucial role, but his presence there is marginal and uh, presumably his, uh, uh, his role in the household, household would have been equally crucial and yet marginal. So um, it seems to me that if we take these practices to be distributed, we cannot deny the role and agency of enslaved people. Um, first of all, this kind of uh, um, paradox where uh, enslaved people were uh, uh, contributing to knowledge production and yet their uh, presence was erased was in fact already adumbrated in antiquity. Aristotle wrote in the politics, and I quote, of tools, some are soulless while others are insold. For instance, for a navigator, the rudder is soulless while the lookout man is insold. And you see that uh, ship image getting you know, back to the surface there. Of course, for us, there is no such thing as a person who is a tool. Aristotle is using his own language, but he's at least acknowledging that some of the elements that go into the complex task of navigation are enslaved. Um, secondly, a uh, distributed cognition framework allows us to view enslaved knowledge workers simultaneously in emic terms, our terms as in, um, sorry, their terms as in sold vocal tools and ethic terms as human agents. We can both inhabit the perspective from which the majority of our canonical texts were produced and expose it by revealing not simply other perspectives, but the dependence of the mainstream perspective on a distributed system of knowledge production. Um, I had an example that would be the next slide, please. But because we're running out of time, I won't go into it. But if you want to know about the example, you can ask me in the questions. And so I'll just uh, go to conclusions, which I believe is the next slide, I hope. Yes. So in conclusion, um, one could say that uh, um, distributed cognition is a different way of describing complex cognitive tasks. Nevertheless, I think that its usefulness goes beyond its power to redefine in that um, it emphasizes collaboration over exceptionality. And in doing so, I think um, it's in tune with other um, 
versions, you know, other um, studies within cognitive anthropology, again, Leib and Wenger's model of legitimate peripheral participation, but also it makes our history of past practices more inclusive. Because while uh, distributed cognition doesn't deny that there are hierarchies, um, it recognizes asymmetries and it makes it possible for us to highlight the, um, the role, the agency of subordinate and enslaved agents. Um, I would say that distributed cognition implodes the distinction between theory and practice because of its uh, emphasis on uh, the existence of both internal and external representations. And that, I think, is borne out by the fact that it can help us illuminate the practices as well as texts. As we've seen in the examples of tables and accounts, it can recover significance for authorless and everyday mathematical texts. And uh, um, finally, it brings to the fore the agents of everyday mathematical practice, which is a, a more diverse cohort than uh, uh, traditional histories of Greek and Roman mathematics have provided so far. And I'll stop there because uh, uh, that was an hour which is already more than I wanted to talk. I think that a lot of <laughs> Thank you, Serafina. Yeah. So, so that was. Uh, uh, I'm sure for many of us who are listening on. Uh, are hearing about Greco-Roman mathematical practices in this room currently. That must have given a very different account of what Greco-Roman mathematics means for us sitting in India. So thank you for that. And uh, because, uh, you know, the both the textbookish nature of the history of mathematics that is very popular and current is, you know, it all ends and begins uh, with Euclid and nothing more. So. Mm -hmm. So therefore, you know, and uh, so that that definitely would give us a different light of what uh, Greco-Roman mathematics is. And given our own Indian encounters with canonical texts and the necessity to uh, mobilize the idea of and the centrality of practice into how do you, you know, uh, account for mathematical histories, not only through textual corpus, but also through the realm of practices. That was also the most uh, uh, central learning thing. I wouldn't talk more, but I would invite everyone to ask uh, questions and uh, let's have a, a discussion on this. And, uh... Do you want to stop sharing the screen? So. Yeah, sure. You can write the question on the chat box if you don't want to talk, but you can also, since there are only a few of us, please feel free to talk as well. Okay, so while others might think through, I thought I will just uh, uh, share my own uh, one is uh, the proximity to the uh, to our own context, which is uh, you know the idea of uh, collaboration, the idea of uh, the cognitive ability to be distributed across agents, across time and space, uh, especially the accretionary nature of the thing, the cumulative nature of knowledge, and then uh, and it's not the lone solitary genius and the centrality of practice, all this is something that uh, uh, that we are trying to reconstruct in the Indian context, since we do have this heavily hegemonic corpus of canonical texts, which has mm. defined uh, the Indian uh, Indian history as well. I mean, the, the Indian history of mathematics. That's all. But uh, there is one particular 
predicament, if I may call it that, which is uh, if the idea of uh, contending with distributed cognition is based on our democratic impulse, you know, mm. to be able to reconstruct uh, this thing. So to bring in the enslaved agents, to bring in practice, to bring in, you know, uh, the context and the, and the immersion into the social context and to find activities that were mathematical beyond what the canonical tradition says and all these things. So there is this very, some people frown at it, not out of uh, contempt uh, to this effort, but more out of, but what do you gain by bringing in all this into the ambit of mathematical thinking? Because uh, either because they are too practical, they are because too everyday, or, you know, so there are a lot of labeling happens without mm -hmm. step, stepping into the cognitive realm of what those mathematical activities actually uh, meant. So to that extent, I think uh, to bring the cognitive and the social together into one common framework uh, and to account for the everyday, the ordinary, the practical, like accounting, like counting and like measuring, uh, is something that I I think for the in the historiographical sense it is quite enriching and th that's something that uh, we are trying to do. But then, is there any way that you would suggest that the demand for a democratic impulse through the framework of distributed uh, cognition can account for the contempt for the everyday, which is you know that's not mathematical enough, not sufficiently uh, abstract not sufficiently important therefore and therefore you know the the mathematical activity of the enslaved people is like too ordinary i mean why should you even look at it like you know it's yeah so. i mean that is an excellent question in a sense i bypassed the question by saying i'm working on numeracy rather than mathematics but then the question becomes, what's the relationship between numeracy and mathematics? So I'm one of those people who think that uh, um, there's a continuity. I don't think that the upper end, high end mathematics is a, a completely separate sphere from the lower end mathematics. I haven't really built up the argument yet. And to some extent, there's never going to be enough evidence to say that uh, Archimedes is not on a separate planet from the people who uh, calculate the area of a, a, a field that may vaguely be circular. To some extent, as, as you know, I think it becomes a, a, an ideological discussion. And so I believe that there's continuity also because I have a certain view of knowledge and society. And uh, I, I think that to some extent, um, it's part of, uh, you know, what when there isn't enough evidence to go one way or the other, the gap is filled by our ideas about the knowledge of society, democracy, and so on. So that's how I feel it. So um, I would say that what the enslaved person was doing when counting and calculating is uh, one uh, is part of the same spectrum that uh, uh, at the you know on, on a, in a different direction has uh, uh, Ptolemy or Euclid doing their thing. At the same time, by calling it numeracy, I also um, argue for the historical importance of it. So let's move away from just mathematics. We could say history of mathematics is an interesting subject in itself, but if something is so insulated from society that it's got nothing to do with society, then we would have to justify why we're even interested in the history of mathematics at all. So mathematics itself is running the risk of becoming irrelevant. By saying I'm looking at the society and maths, I think I'm actually making it more relevant. So a second answer, uh, let me try, I mean, I, I'm kind of thinking on my feet here, but a first answer would be to say that uh, um, sociologically and culturally, 
there isn't a sharp boundary between advanced mathematics and not advanced mathematics, between high-end mathematics and low-end mathematics, that they all belong on a continuum and that we cannot understand the high end without understanding the low end. Even Archimedes said to learn to count before he could do everything else. He had to main or learn to measure before he could do everything else. So an understanding of the whole spectrum of mathematical of mathematics helps us either way. That's one possible way of tackling the question. The second way is that we are, after all, historians, and history is not just about the masterpiece. It's also about everything else that was, in fact, socially relevant. So, you know, you could just today uh, say, if I want to study music, I can look at, God knows, I mean, uh, whatever... Ah, uh, yes, uh, I'll get to that in a moment, Ayush. We could say, I want to study music and just look at, uh, I don't know, um, Steve Reich or Philip Glass are doing today. Or we could say that to understand the music today, in fact, it makes more sense to analyze um, Beyonce or, uh, or similar. So if we want to understand not just mathematics but the history of mathematics then we have to look at it historically and it just so happens that someone like Archimedes probably didn't leave as much of a space on uh, the running of uh, I don't know the, 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 the Roman Empire well obviously it didn't as much as uh, uh, the, the scribes uh, uh, in, uh, in Rome, putting together the census or the tax roll or the land survey. So from a historical point of view, these type of operations and practices are in fact much more significant than uh, something that would only be accessible to a small elite. And then of course, yeah, there are the consequences in terms of, uh, of education. I do think that um, Today, a better understanding of numeracy historically could actually help for uh, um, better uh, embedding of uh, uh, functional numeracy in education. In fact, that's a, a question I would have for you. Is... Um, what is the situation with uh, numeracy in schools? Because here they're uh, very, very worried. So the numeracy rate, and particularly functional numeracy of adults, are very low compared to um, the kind of countries that the UK compares itself with. And so they're uh, uh, trying to find ways to uh, bring more children close to maths, or particularly to have more uh, children study maths at A levels. Can you hear me? Oops. Yes, yes, yeah. Because Jam, you have to unmute yourself. Ah, uh, I said we can hear you. Yeah. Yes. Okay. No, Jam. Serafina wants to. Uh, select so, the situation about functional numeracy in the Indian classroom yeah. environment. Um, but I'm just, I'll come to it later. I, I had something else to ask yes, about. Sir, please, please I yeah. yeah. Um, I think I'll stop there because uh, a, a message came up saying my system had run out of memory. I don't know what that means. I got distracted. So, um, yeah. It, it tells me I should force to quit the application. But if you're telling me that you can hear me, then it's fine. Is that so? Hear you so far? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I had a different uh, question. Um, uh, yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I had a slightly different question. I mean, I, I would also be interested to know um, the history of uh, authorship in, uh, you know, 
the Greco-Roman context that you talked about, because you know, in um, or in, in many civilizations, I mean, uh, of course, the pyramids you hear about in India, in all the old temples that were constructed, um, in almost all um, edifices and uh, many um, contexts where numeracy is very critical, or um, even mathematics in many ways. Um, I mean, in some sense, distributed cognition comes across as the more natural thing. The idea of individual cognition and individual understanding certainly seems more specialized to me. Um, so given that, um, how did this uh, even history of authorship and uh, 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 looking at it as individuals' contributions and individuals' compilations of knowledge or uh, creating knowledge in some sense? I mean, so how did this? Uh, historical process take place at all. Um, in the literary classics, there, there are these traditions that uh, even there, I don't think it's universal across cultures, but I see it. But when it comes to applied knowledge of all kinds, I mean, whether it is uh, in science, in medicine, in mathematics, in it is in general being collective and distributed cognition. As in so, I just wanted to get some historical understanding of this and whether you have something to say. Serafina, can you hear us still? I think she is. Did we lose her? Yeah, I think we have, we have lost her. She's gone. I think it should be on a Windows system. Pushed her out for lack of memory, I think. <laughs> Let's just hope she comes back. I don't I, I don't have a means to contact you her otherwise. Should one message her or something? I don't have a number, Jan. <laughs> just email. 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 Just to yeah. I mean, she should. She can't shut down. She can't even see emails. What? Are, why do you say the system will run out of memory? What? After. <laughs> but we can all hear each other, right? Just she is missing. Tell us more. I think uh, about the Indian context, Babu Mumi. Could you hear me? Yeah. Yes, Jeshree. Yeah. yeah. I said, I mean, we'd like to know more about the Indian context. I mean, what's what's possible? What are the kind of uh, sh uh, you know the whole difficulty that we have, even with the history of the so-called mainstream history of mathematics, where. Uh, documents are not available. Uh, when we talk about something like what she is talking about, I mean, how do we even write, uh, you know, kind of a history like this in the Indian context? Yeah, I think so. Jam's question about uh, authorship is something that uh, definitely even the even the canonical corpus has not looked uh, back itself into. For instance, uh, you know, all the uh, the fact that the canonical text could be a compilation of various things over a period of time, you know, through the context of teaching and through the, is pretty much obvious. It is like uh, the the way the problem posing happens through verses, you know, through the following of particular meter, is not codification as a process in itself, just because you write it in a particular metrical form, like, you know, you sing it, you perform it, and you also write it as, as metrical verses. So that proficiency belongs to a particular class, but then the problem posing and the problem solving context and these things were all compiled together. This, this thing about compilation of texts and how do they become canonical, that, that transition into that history is something that, uh, 
uh, we don't know much about and historians of math in india of all kinds they are not even close to acknowledging the fact that the transition history we don't have sources that to that extent i think we can acknowledge the limits and constraints of writing history in india but beyond that he, he, i mean you know, we should open ourselves to the possibility of all these texts becoming compilations over time and space and not merely as projects in translation and that's what undermines this whole thing about uh distribution uh, framework in the indian context i think if everybody had to have translated from leelavathi only you know everybody ought to have translated only from uh, mahavira's uh, text from the 11th century and everything that followed after the fact, 11th uh, everything that none of them were really translations were they i mean in the sense that there were always uh, creative so, elements involved and interpretation elements involved and yeah. uh, and again you don't see individuals uh, it's uh, usually commentaries and uh, references across so so that's why i felt that you know the distributed commission framework that is being talked about is the norm in fact it's not the something to yeah it's the authorship that is not the norm and in fact where um, and also perhaps the question is more about why certain certain commentaries became uh, you know got to be acknowledged as important or grew in importance in some fashion certain compilations over others ah so serafina sent an email saying her computer crashed sorry jam you need to go na no no i mean how uh, no no i just got a email from serafina saying her computer crash and she's not being able to restart it okay. so should we wait or no i don't think she says you will have to stop there yeah yeah and uh, we can compile a list of questions and send it to her and then we can circulate the answers so so ayush uh, i will definitely get this question by a email and introduce a uh, thing to her and so about jan's question as well and ravi's thing about floating books yes any other questions please do let me know i can compile a list of questions and i can Okay. Share it with Serafina. So I think only word of thanks is missing. I'm not sure. <laughs> yes. No. No. I uh, for the particular reason that I was got interested in Serafina's work because over a period of time she is one uh, scholar who has uh, stepped out of the Greco-Roman canon and then looked into land surveying, looked into accounting, looked into uh you know the possibility of the transition from the mesopotamian to the roman egypt to the greco roman thing and someone who looked into euclid as if it could have been a set of practices from different sources and origins you know mm. this this impulse to break into the canon and unearth and reconstruct a different history is something that is right. that she has spent a very long time mm. trained by the same uh, historian like lloyd you know from oxford in the department of classics and it's very difficult to step out of the canon if you have got trained into the department of classics at oxford under jeffrey lloyd you know who established the canon in the first place mm. and therefore so that is the fascinating part about uh, serafina's mm. work Wonderful. and uh, so each of the examples that she gave today on land surveying on accounting you know on uh, uh, numeracy in the in the context of the enslaved people all these are uh thing that she has very solid evidence hmm. uh and she has studied she is one of the best epigraphist of greco roman inscriptions that oxford classics department has produced so it's not uh merely you know a uh, high polluting rhetorical question that she is asking but based on very solid evidence hmm. and that is what uh provides strength to her work so so yeah so please do uh she has this interesting uh article on land surveying if you uh, search and also her forthcoming book is also about measuring counting and weighing in the greco roman times and how to count 
uh, using the cognition uh, framework. And uh, yeah, so I hope uh, we'll all get to read it at some point of time and benefit. So thank you everyone for coming, sparing the time. And uh, I will also uh, send out the link to the recording if some of you want to uh, want to listen. Okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Ayush. Thanks, Ravi. Yeah. Copy the questions. Yeah. Okay.